This is Teachers Talk Radio, and you are listening live. Hello and welcome to The Twilight Show. Thanks for joining me. Today, my special guest is Gemma Archer, and we will be talking about teaching English pronunciation. This is Teachers Talk Radio, and you are listening live. Tune in live at ttradio.org, or to join in the conversation, download the Podbean app and search Teachers Talk Radio. Follow the hashtag TT Radio. Tune in, talk it out with Teachers Talk Radio. Welcome to The Twilight Show, everyone. I'm Graham Stanley, speaking to you live from Mexico City. As I mentioned earlier on today's show, I'll be talking to Gemma Archer about pronunciation and accent, uh, among other things. Now, Gemma Archer is a teacher of English for academic purposes and program coordinator in the English language teaching unit at the University of Strathclyde in Glasgow in Scotland. She's also a pronunciation specialist, teacher trainer, and joint coordinator of the IATEFL, that's the International Association of Teachers for Teachers of English as a Foreign Language, uh, Pronunciation Special Interest Group, or PRONSIG, as well as being outgoing editor of the same SIG's biannual journal, Speak Out. She's author of Teaching English Pronunciation for a Global Word, published by Oxford University Press this year, and her research interests lie in the field of pronunciation and pedagogy, uh, sorry, pronunciation, pedagogy, and accent, and the issues which can arise when students and teachers of English are confronted with diverse regional and global varieties of English. And this last thing led her to the creation of the Scottish Sound School, which is a resource to help new arrivals to Scotland acclimate to the unfamiliar sounds of Scottish pronunciation. And I'll be talking to Gemma about her work and more after the Teachers Talk Radio News. Imagine having your own instructional coach available 24-7. Now you can with the teaching how-tos platform. This highly personalised social platform empowers busy teachers to learn and apply evidence-based teaching techniques either independently, working collaboratively with their peers, or with our new AI assistant. The platform features over 160 visual guides to teaching techniques, designed to help you quickly and easily implement high-impact practices that boost student engagement and improve learning outcomes. Join over 200 institutions worldwide that are elevating their teaching practices with the HowTo app. No gurus, just practical support anytime you need it. Interested in finding out more? Visit teachinghowtos.com and register for our next webinar. Empowering education with Easy For You, where innovation meets accessibility. Our subscription-based offering not only equips schools with cutting-edge devices, but revolutionizes the learning experience by eliminating financial barriers, streamlining support, and embracing technology, we're not just providing tools. We're shaping a future where every student can thrive, unburdened by limitations. Easy for you. Transforming education. One device at a time. Find out more at www.easyforyou. School. This show is brought to you in partnership with John Cat Educational, publishers of professional development books and resources that support great teaching and learning in schools around the world. Don't miss out. Level up your professional development today and visit johncatbookshop.com to explore the full range of titles. Use the code JCTTR2425 for 20% off your order. Happy reading. Hi, teachers. We're Apps for Good, and we give schools like yours free introductory computing courses. 
our courses are for everyone, including those who aren't computing teachers, and they're fully equipped with resources mapped to the UK computing curriculum. Independent learning is central to our courses. Your students will develop essential and digital skills by working in teams to create prototype apps for good. We'll even connect you with industry volunteers to give real-world feedback. Let's empower every young person you teach to shape their future with technology. Speak to us at www.appsforgood.org. This is Teachers Talk Radio, and this is Teachers Talk Radio News. Teachers and GPs are staggering under extra demands caused by poverty, according to a report in The Guardian. Desperate families, unable to afford food, clothing or heating, are increasingly turning to education and health services for help. New research has shown what, for many, has long been understood through anecdotal evidence. Namely, that teachers and GPs are acting as welfare advisors, housing officers and social workers alongside the day job. The study by the Joseph Rowntree Foundation also found that some teachers and GPs were providing toys and books, as well as basic essentials as such as food and clothing for children. Poverty campaigners have warned that the situation is now urgent. The study found that a third of schools and almost half of GP surgeries had set up a food bank. 44% of pupils were estimated to have come to school hungry and health and education staff were dipping into their own pockets to help the others. Education staff said resources were being devoted to firefighting poverty and issues linked to it, but that meant less time and energy being spent on teaching. The report features a case study on a school in Manchester and full details can be found on the Guardian website. The BBC News website has focused again on funding for special educational needs, with councils in England forecasting a massive shortfall in budgets. The BBC has found councils face a deficit of almost £1 billion, with signs that the gap between funding and spending is continuing to increase. Parent groups have focused on the difficulty in obtaining an education, health and care plan. They believe that without one, it's much harder to get specific support. Almost 600,000 children and young people now have an EHCP in England and last year saw a 26% year-on-year increase. The growing demand is something councils are struggling to meet and campaign groups expressed concern that some now have very little focus on children's needs because they're worried about the financial bottom line. The NAHT union has called for any new government to write off council's accumulated deficits in SEND, but none of the mainstream parties address funding of SEND directly in their manifestos. The Conservatives have promised 15 more special schools. Labour promised to increase early interventions and mainstream support. The Lib Dems said they would establish a national body for SEND funding to be managed. And the Greens said they would push for £5 billion of investment for mainstream schools. Full details, along with a series of linked stories, can be found on the BBC website. Schools Week have focused on Labour's manifesto promise to scrap single word Ofsted judgments and replace the current system with a report card telling parents clearly how schools are performing. There have been very few details, however, of what this could actually look like. The Schools Week report considers a wide range of options for the scorecard, having asked a range of stakeholders for their views on what information it could or should contain. Labour has promised to consult the sector on its plans. It's likely that changes would require a new inspection framework and some changes to current legislation, which would delay plans changes for around a year. Full details of the discussion can be found on the Schools Week website. In Louisiana, USA, every public school classroom has been ordered to display a poster of the Ten Commandments, according to a report on the BBC News website. It is the first measure of its kind in the US and applies to all classrooms in the state up to university level. Opponents to the move say the law breaks America's separation of church and state protected by the First Amendment to the US Constitution. 
In 1980, the US Supreme Court struck down a Kentucky law, similar to the Louisiana law, which required the Ten Commandments to be displayed in elementary and high schools. Finally, the BBC also reports on calls by the National Secular Society for a school in Wales to be investigated after it allegedly promoted creationism. The NSS is calling for a ban on teaching creationism as it undermines teaching about evidence-based theories such as evolution. The teaching of creationism as a scientific theory is banned in England, but the promotion of it is not prohibited in Wales. A Welsh government spokesperson said, Community schools are not permitted to have a religious leaning, and we are in discussions with the relevant local authority. Full details of this story can be found in the education section of the BBC News website. This has been your Teachers Talk Radio News with Joe Fox. So welcome back everyone and welcome in particular to my special guest, Gemma Archer. Welcome Gemma, what have you been up to today? Hi, thank you for having me today. Oh, it was a boring Friday, going through emails and responding to students, nothing in particular. <laughs> and And Gemma, what I usually do is ask my guests how they got involved and interested in education how they became teachers what was it with you was it something that you always wanted to do or was it an unexpected route well it was it was definitely an unexpected route I'm one of these accidental teachers it was never my goal to become an English language teacher it wasn't even you know uh, in my kind of field of vision I loved languages. I studied languages at high school and then I did a, an undergraduate degree in Italian as well as English. And at that time, when you did a, a language uh, in the UK at the graduate level, you had to do an Erasmus year. Sadly, no longer the case, thanks to Brexit. At that time, we did get to, to, to go away for a year and I went away to Italy. But before I left, someone said to me, you know, uh, have you considered teaching English while you're out there getting get a qualification before you go? Because you'll be able to kind of finance yourself a bit more comfortably. So again, having never kind of considered it, I looked at the CELTA, applied and was successful and did my, my CELTA certificate in the summer uh, before heading out to Italy in September. And, uh, and so I started my teaching career in Milan. Uh, in uh, a small school in Milan, which was very relaxed, and I had um, really positive, comfortable, first kind of experience teaching English, and I just really enjoyed it. I enjoyed the students I was working with, and I just kind of fell into it from there, really. So that's that's the story. <laughs> oh, wonderful! And what was it that you saw when you were started teaching that you thought? actually this is for me after you know you did it to finance yourself when you were in in Milan mm -hmm. what was it that you thought well actually I really like this I loved working in an international capacity with people from all over the world um I loved learning about different cultures and and having a, a class either abroad or in the UK I also worked in Ireland or even multilingual learners um but it was always fascinating and um, yeah, I just enjoyed that intercultural part of it um, in particular, I think. Right. And apart from Milan and Ireland, have you been teaching anywhere else? Or Yeah, I did uh, teach at a university in Saudi Arabia uh, for a time, uh, which was uh, Princess Princess Noura, which is the, well, it was at the time, probably still is the largest women's uh, only university in the world. Uh, so that was in, in Riyadh in Saudi Arabia. Yeah. But that was before things started to ease up. That was before women were allowed to drive. <laughs> right. Before things okay. started to change a little bit. So yeah, it was an interesting time. Of course, yeah. Uh, it's always interesting to have these intercultural experiences, isn't it? Yes, uh, yes it's wonderful. One of the great things about teaching English is that you you can explore a large part of the world and uh, mm -hmm. and get a lot of different uh, views on it. Absolutely. No, it's. Uh, I think it's the part that kept me in the job. You know, yeah. um, it was it was so interesting and the opportunities certainly. You know, we're, we're, we're so exciting. 
And you are now at the University of Strathclyde in Glasgow, yep. Scotland. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, how long have you been there? So I, like like many teachers who come from the UK, uh, you know, you go away nine months of the year to teach abroad and then you come back for the summer uh, because so many schools abroad don't pay, you know, the, the summer months. So I began in that kind of role that I was looking for summer work. And um, I'd started teaching at uh, another university in Glasgow, but um, this this opportunity, uh, this was in 2010, uh, this opportunity came up to, to do some pre-sessional work for students who are going to begin their main degree programme in English in the UK, so at the University of Strathclyde, for example, um, but their English is not quite at that level where they can begin their course. So the pre-sessional programmes are this kind of preparatory course where students have time to increase their, their language proficiency uh, for a September start. So that's that's I started there in 2010. And um, uh, again, it was just summer work for a while. And uh, I finally got my, my permanent position in 2015. So yeah, I've been there for a few years now. Great. And was it at the University of Strathclyde that you developed an interest in pronunciation or is that something that has always uh, appealed to you as a as an English teacher? It was definitely part of the journey. <clears throat> Anyone that's ever heard me talk about this before, I'm such a broken record, but um, I, I started teaching or attempting to teach pronunciation uh, in its way in that first job I was telling you about, um, but it just all went horribly, horribly wrong. And oh, I really? would just, uh, yeah, I because I had so like many teachers, you know, I'd had so little pronunciation training. And when I say little, I mean an hour on a CELTA course, transcribing my name with the IPA. That was pretty much the extent of the explicit pronunciation training I had. So from that, you know, trying to actually teach it in the classroom and just failed miserably and confused my students and made a fool of myself. Uh, and so after those early experiences, I just didn't teach pronunciation at all. Um, and literally for, for eight years, didn't teach any pronunciation. Um, I was terrified that someone was going to ask me about it. So beyond students saying, how do you pronounce this? You know, giving them the correct pronunciation, I stayed away from it. It was, was not something I believed I could do. And certainly I, I didn't have the time. When you're a full-time teacher, you've got a lot of contact hours. You don't have the time or the energy to be researching and finding the answers to so many of your questions. So certainly for those first kind of eight years of my career, I, I stayed away from pronunciation. And then I, as I said, I started working at the University of Strathclyde. And one of the uh, classes I was given um, was an elective class. And um, the elective class was in pronunciation and clear speaking. And again, terrified because I didn't feel that I had enough knowledge to teach this. So I had to kind of scramble together books and resources, but I, I still didn't feel confident. And at that point, I then went on to do my diploma. And um, the diploma was being run by a, a company in Scotland. And it was the first time ever, ever anyone had mentioned, um, oh, by the way, you know that most pronunciation resources are written in certain accent usually received pronunciation what we now call standard southern british english um which is quite you know different in many ways from your accent or from our accent here in scotland so that was the first time anyone had ever mentioned explicitly what differences or what difficulties there might be for uh for me for us as regional teachers regional speaking english teachers um, and so it was this kind of combination of having to teach a class and and finally acknowledgement that sure there's going to be some challenges here that, that got me started learning more about pronunciation and being quite fascinated because I felt I wanted to overcome my fear. I wanted to get better. I didn't want to have this constant worry about teaching pronunciation. And I knew that a huge hurdle for that was going to be uh, understanding my own voice and how it differed from everything that's in ELT materials. Uh, so that's that's basically how I, I got into pronunciation in the beginning. Bit of a saga. How oh, wonderful. It's, that's a really interesting journey, I think. Um, 
a lot of teachers like yourself, and I have to say I, I was one of them, do avoid teaching pronunciation for the very reasons that you said. It's it's not an easy task to do, especially if you don't know or haven't received sort of training really to to do it or you don't have the resources to do it, which was your case and was definitely my case. But it is an important part of of English language teaching and learning, isn't it? Fundamental. It's fundamental to every single skill. Um, if you think about the role that pronunciation has, you cannot separate it from anything really. So whenever we're doing pronunciation work, we're getting like a you're doing prawn work, but you're actually having a positive impact on all the skills. So for instance, if you're working on um sound spelling correspondences. You know, allowing students time to recognize and identify certain letters uh, and how they correspond to sound. We're, we're creating a phonological loop in the memory, which helps students to recognize words more quickly and more easily that the retrieval speed increases. Um, and this has an impact on the reading skills and on their writing skills as well. And of course, there's the obvious link between pronunciation and speaking and listening. Um, when we work on pronunciation, we're allowing students to be able to identify the sounds that they're hearing in speech, particularly if you're going down the route of things like um, connected speech, uh, prosody, um, simulation, vowel sounds. So all of these kind of receptive skills what we teach in pronunciation, it's kind of like pronunciation for listening. So that has a, a very significant impact as well. And, and when we're teaching pronunciation solely in a, a speaking component, you know, where we're not just helping students to speak more intelligibly, um, a huge part of it is giving them confidence because so many students um, have real fear and anxiety about their pronunciation um, and are, are self-conscious and don't want to speak out and practice because of this fear. So Whenever we're doing pronunciation work, we're having a positive impact on, on all of the skills. Um, so really, it is a, a hugely fundamental part of what we do. And like you said, very many teachers um, won't do it because we, we don't have this initial training to get us started. You know, um, that, that's something that many, many teachers around the world have in common. They don't have it. Or, and this is certainly what I've heard from more international L2 speaking teachers, they have the phonetics background, they don't have the pedagogical background. So they know a bit about sound systems and what phonemes are and what sounds and pictures are occurring in language. They maybe don't have that pedagogical grounding of how they can then teach it and bring it into the classroom. So there's a huge gap for, for so many teachers of English. And I think it does have a, a real negative impact on, on the teaching of pronunciation. And what, Gemma, do you think is the most or the fundamental part of 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 teaching pronunciation? What is it that you can really help students with? What would be the focus, do you think, if if a teacher is listening at the moment and they haven't really tackled with pronunciation in the classroom, where should they start? Yeah, and again, I think another um, feature is that it seem quite overwhelming. You know, you're like all of these sounds of English, where do I even begin? Um, and I think that's quite putting as well, not knowing where to begin. And it's certainly it's something that I observe all the time um, in, in teachers that I'm working with. It's it's that where do I even begin? What's that first step? Um, with a couple of things that you can do. Uh, one of the things I always suggest is do a little needs analysis with your students to find out what they're strengths and weaknesses are and use that to guide you. You know, this could be something as simple as uh, reading a paragraph that is recorded and emailed to the teacher or giving some kind of stimulus that students have to respond to orally and being recording and sending to the teacher. So that's an easy way to do it. But if you don't have the time for that, for, for whatever reason, um, one of the most simple things that we can implement is the Lingua Franca core. Lingua Franca Core uh, was created by Jennifer Jenkins in the 1990s, and it's based on her recordings of international students over several years when they are communicating with one another. And it, she noticed and identified and categorized all of the mistakes as a communication breakdown together with one another. 
then created the lingua franca core, so areas which we need to prioritise in our teaching to help increase international intelligibility between international LT speakers. So in the lingua franca core, we prioritise all consonant sounds. Consonants are very important, apart from the dental fricatives like in thing or the and there. Um, these two sounds are used, um, uh, you know, they're replaced by many alternative sounds by speakers, not just native speakers, but international as well. And what we know is that you can replace these two sounds with others and still be intelligible. So, for example, some people might say ting, thing, and they'll still be understood. So all consonant sounds are important apart from those two. Consonant clusters, when we have consonant sounds one after the other with no vowel in between, for example, that's in students, again, at the ending, we have a consonant cluster. Um, these consonant clusters are uh, not found in every language. Certainly, if you have students who have a Slavic language background, they'll probably cope with these very well. For many students, these don't, uh, they're not part of their mother tongue inventory. So it's it's a challenge to, to pronounce consonant clusters intelligibly. So that's another of the features which are important to focus on. Um, we also think that uh, we know that nuclear stress is very important for intelligibility. So when we say nuclear stress, this is known by a couple of other names. It can be called sentence stress or tonic stress. And it's when we make one word in a phrase more emphasized than all the others. And it will contain the most relevant content to the message that we're trying to deliver. So nuclear stress is very important for intelligibility. And we also know that um, vowel durational differences are important for intelligibility. So the difference between tense and lax vowels, such as that famous one, ship and speak, that length duration, that, that tense lax differentiation is important, um, as well as vowel differences that come before or come uh, before a, a voiced or an unvoiced consonant. Um, that's got this really fancy name, which is pre fortis clipping. Um, but what we, an example of this, for example, would be um, the, the vowel difference in the words mat and mad. So mat, having an unvoiced consonant after the vowel, is going to be shorter compared to the vowel in mad, which has a voiced consonant at the end. Um, so those durational differences in the vowels are important as well. So this is a, a list of features that we know are important for international intelligibility when two L2 speakers are communicating with each other. Um, if students have input on these features, they will improve their intelligibility. So it's a great first step. If you're not sure where to begin, look at the Lingua Franca core, use that to guide you. That's, that's really, really useful. Long, no, no, it's very useful. I was fascinated by that, Gemma. That's great. I'd not come across that uh, before, to my shame. But um, I will definitely look it up, the Lingua Franca core. That sounds uh, really useful and very practical, I think, and aimed at L2 speakers yeah. understanding each other. The intelligibility yeah. bit is really interesting. I think it's it's a, a very much, I mean, I say it's much needed. It's been around since. 2000 so it's 24 years old now and Jennifer Jenkins work began even before that in the 1990s um but what's also really important about the lingua franca court is it's acknowledging that these prestige model native speakers are not the goal the goal is yeah. not to sound like the queen or the king or yeah. someone who works in Cambridge or Oxford or you know that kind of uh for class native speaker it is the point of our work is to make students intelligible to each other and to other speakers. Um, and it takes a really, like the concept of teaching students pronunciation to sound like a native speaker. I mean, fair enough, that might be their goal, but it's incredibly time consuming. Learning every single sound of English to native like level, incredibly time consuming. And it's largely useful. Some students certainly will get there, but it's so much effort and so much time. Um, there are so many variables involved 
in becoming native-like that is not possible for everyone. So I think the Lingua Franca core offers something that's very achievable for all mm -hmm. students, no matter where they are. Yeah. And also, there is, you know, what is a native speaker? I mean, you speak different to me, to, and I speak different to someone who would be native to Cambridge, for example, would speak different to someone who was born in Brisbane, in Australia, or et cetera, et cetera. So that's the kind of difficulty, isn't it? It's, it's, if a, if a student white. was aiming yeah. to do, to become native speaker, like, uh, in their pronunciation, then it's what what is the native speaker model that they are trying to sound like? And if you look at our resources for forever, uh, there's been two models, and that and they have been the choice. And and I'm sure many of your your listeners have heard the question: Oh, do you teach British English or American English? Because they were the only two choices. Yeah. And if you look at any of our public any. The majority of our publications, whether they be course books or teacher training resources, they're the only two uh, models that we see. So it's it's really not given anyone much of a choice. So um, yeah, that's the, the the lingua franca core. When I came across it, it set me free. Suddenly, I had something that I could do that would really target those features that my students needed practice with and and the positive impact on them. So. Yeah, it's uh, it's such a great piece of work. Great. That's really interesting. And Gemma, what about accent? Because I know accent is a feature of your research. And it's something as someone who, when I left the northeast of England, I went studying in London and I suffered in my first couple of years as a student in London, being surrounded by students who were who didn't speak like me and actually took the mickey out of my accent a lot. And I made a point. Um, I'll, I'll tell a little anecdote here just to, to put you and the listeners in the picture. So I remember I was late for the cinema and I was in a queue um, and at that point in cinemas in London, they only sold two things, and one of them was popcorn, and the other was something I asked for in that queue. Said, "Can I have a coke, please?" <laughs> and the uh, the person serving me just looked at me as if I, as if I was from Mars, and I was like, "A coke." And she was like, I'm sorry, I don't know what you um, are asking <laughs> for. And I, and I pointed behind her and said, you serve two things, popcorn and Coke. And I want oh. Coke. Mm -hmm. And she got really embarrassed. It wasn't that she was deliberately trying to uh, to annoy me, but it, it it that was a kind of key moment for me that I decided yeah. I can't live like this. I need to change the way I speak if I'm going to be in London. So I actually actively changed my accent which is very strange and then also again when i became a teacher of english i was aware that i thought uh that i needed to speak differently for my students otherwise i would be doing a disservice to them but then subsequently i have met um a lot of teachers with strong regional accents and it they um i'm happy to say that they haven't lost their accents mm -hmm. and it and it actually is really a, a relief but that was definitely how I felt so having given you a personal experience of my me and accents what are you what is your take on this yeah um I've had so many <laughs> so many similar experiences and like you I don't have I don't have a strong Scottish accent people say to me all the time Gemma where in England are you from um so I I think um it, it, yeah, even even despite that, I've had many experiences in the same, and I would say Coke in a kind of similar way to you. Um, I think it really highlights two things. Um, one is accommodation, and the other is the role of familiarity. So what you described when you talked about changing your voice, your accent to suit your listener, this is actually something that most people do. Uh, we accommodate suit our listener so that they understand a bit more easily and to avoid communication breakdowns that's very common especially if you're an English teacher or you're working in an international environment um, and it just shows awareness and concern for the listener we want to be understood 
we want to um, you know, meet the goal of our, our communication, our conversation, which is to transfer information. Um, and when we have these experiences, we learn when we need to accommodate, you know, um, and, and I do exactly the same. We, we change depending on where we are and who we're speaking to. That is totally normal. Um, and, and like you, I have many colleagues who uh, accommodate more or accommodate less, depending on, on who's in front of them. Um, but the role of familiarity is, is so important because even if you are speaking what we would judge to be intelligible English, if we are not familiar with an accent, we can have problems understanding it. And that's not the speaker's fault. You know, um, all communication is 50-50 between the speaker and the listener. And we need a listener that cares and wants to understand and makes an effort to understand us as much as we, the speaker, need to accommodate to suit them as well. So it's a 50-50 role that we all play in communication. And as you experienced, if your um, cinema uh, attendee or you know, cashier had not heard that pronunciation of cloak before, um, despite it being so obvious, you know, it possibly just went over her head. But um, this is, is hugely significant in the classroom for our learners. And it's something that, as you said, I've, I've done research on this role of familiarity. And, um, and what we know is that, as we said, students mainly have exposure only to one or two types of English, standard British, standard Southern British English, RP, or general American English. General American English started to become um, a much more common model after the Second World War. And of course, now it's very, very accessible because of the media, because of streaming services, music, film industry, all of the above, even the gaming industry. So these two models are very, very accessible to students. And the more they access them, the more familiar they become with them. And what happens when you become familiar with an accent it becomes easier. It becomes more intelligible to you. You also like it more. We like what we are used to. So you, be, you start to have all of these positive associations with the accents that you are familiar with. And then what happens to those students is they are presented with an unfamiliar accent. So in, in the case of my students, they, they spend, you know, 10 years learning English using standard British English or, or general American. They get their IELTS 6.5 and then they come to Glasgow for their postgraduate studies, get off the plane and they go, I can't understand a word <laughs> people are saying to me. And the second they get off the plane going through customs, uh, getting in a taxi, I have so many stories from students about this kind of 20 minute journey from the airport to, to their accommodation, trying to communicate with taxi drivers. Um, so, and, and it's because they have little or no familiarity with accent that they're suddenly hearing all around them. And for many students, they don't even know that they're going to hear a different accent. In my example, they think I'm going to the United Kingdom. Everyone will speak standard Southern British English or, you know, the, the English that they've heard all of their academic careers. So they are totally um, flummoxed. They are, they are blindsided by this new accent. And what can happen is they can become more anxious at conversing with local people because they think I'm not going to understand a word they say. So they might not want to communicate with local people or have these conversations. And they can also attach negative associations to these unfamiliar accents because there is a cognitive cost to listening to an unfamiliar accent. It takes longer for the brain to process an unfamiliar accent. That's that's not a you know it's not a fault in the speaker, it's just biology. It takes us longer to process. And um, that longer processing time can, you know, also relate to communication breakdowns. And again, students um, associating this as being, it's a difficult accent. It's, um, it's not good English. When in fact, it doesn't matter the accent. There's no one accent that's more intelligible than any others. The most intelligible accent is the one you are most familiar with. So familiarity plays a huge, huge role 
in all communication, but we see it so clearly in, in the ELT industry. Imagine having your own instructional coach available 24 seven. Now you can with the teaching how to's platform. This highly personalized social platform empowers busy teachers to learn and apply evidence-based teaching techniques, either independently, working collaboratively with their peers or with our new AI assistant. The platform features over 160 visual guides to teaching techniques designed to help you quickly and easily implement high-impact practices that boost student engagement and improve learning outcomes. Join over 200 institutions worldwide that are elevating their teaching practices with the HowTo app. No gurus, just practical support anytime you need it. Interested in finding out more? Visit teachinghowtos.com and register for our next webinar. Imagine having your own instructional coach available 24-7. Now you can with the teaching how-tos platform. This highly personalized social platform empowers busy teachers to learn and apply evidence-based teaching techniques, either independently, working collaboratively with their peers or with our new AI assistant. The platform features over 160 visual guides to teaching techniques designed to help you quickly and easily implement high-impact practices that boost student engagement and improve learning outcomes. Join over 200 institutions worldwide that are elevating their teaching practices with the HowTo app. No gurus, just practical support anytime you need it. Interested in finding out more? Visit teachinghowtos.com and register for our next webinar. Empowering education with Easy For You, where innovation meets accessibility. Our subscription-based offering not only equips schools with cutting-edge devices, but revolutionizes the learning experience by eliminating financial barriers, streamlining support, and embracing technology, we're not just providing tools. We're shaping a future where every student can thrive, unburdened by limitations. Easy for you, transforming education, one device at a time. Find out more at www.easyforyou. Dot school. This show is brought to you in partnership with John Cat Educational, publishers of professional development books and resources that support great teaching and learning in schools around the world. Don't miss out. Level up your professional development today and visit johncatbookshop.com to explore the full range of titles. Use the code JCTTR2425 for 20% off your order. Happy reading. Hi, teachers. We're Apps for Good, and we give schools like yours free introductory computing courses. Our courses are for everyone, including those who aren't computing teachers, and they're fully equipped with resources mapped to the UK computing curriculum. Independent learning is central to our courses. Your students will develop essential and digital skills by working in teams to create prototype apps for good. We'll even connect you with industry volunteers to give real-world feedback. Let's empower every young person you teach to shape their future with technology. Speak to us at www.appsforgood.org. I imagine in your role um, at the university, supporting the students who are going to be spending time in the city and at the university you have a kind of dual role if i look at things with a broad brush don't you of having to prepare the students to be able to uh, attend and understand their courses but also uh, outside of the university where perhaps they're going to be exposed to all different varieties of uh, of of english yeah. And some of them will be more challenging than others. I think you, you you do have that kind of additional role of preparing them for that as well. So mm -hmm. how do you approach that? Um, I think there are very simple ways to start. And I say this in a broad way. This is not just specific to where I live. <clears throat> One of the easiest ways that we can start to normalise the discussion of accent diversity, preparing students for the world of global accents, mm, yeah. many, is to 
ask questions and this could be as simple as we've done a listening activity um so in the listening activity the the speaker said this word is that the same as how i speak it you know maybe it could be car for instance I, is that how i would say it how would i say it and i would say r why would I say it this way? So in Scotland, the R is always pronounced, but you know, in, in other varieties like uh, in in England or in Indian English, a lot of Indian Englishes are, are, are non-rhotic, like uh, standard Southern British English or Australian English or New Zealand English or South African English, you know, or even in um, West African Englishes, you know, in Nigerian speakers, for instance, um, they will all be non-rhotic or many will be non-rhotic. So, we can we can we can provide these very small teachable moments where we start to introduce little by little the concept of diverse Englishes. Um, it's also nice uh, if if students are if they are uncomfortable listening to diverse Englishes if they don't want to because it's hard or it's difficult. Um, you know, asking students to listen and transcribe a little bit of the speaker. Um, because often you find that the, the speaker, even if they are scented, are intelligible and students can listen, understand and write down the sentence that they've spoken. And this is a test of intelligibility where we're saying to students, you know, how was that to understand? And they may have negative feelings about it. Oh, it was really challenging. Hang on, you wrote down every single word. And, and using this as a, a starting off point let's let's look at the pronunciation of this word in particular how did the speaker pronounce it um let's see if we can find other examples of this pronunciation in the next bit of the listening so there are lots of very simple ways that we can start the discussion on diverse accents and making that normal to students because i think for so many students as we said at the beginning it's just british or american these are the only two options when we know that English is a global language, estimated 2 billion speakers or users of English now. So we know that they are likely going to encounter accents beyond just those two models that we see in all of the teaching resources. So I think it's imperative that we start normalizing these discussions, introducing different varieties of English where you can, um, so that students are prepared and they don't have this absolute error when they do mainly interact with, with, with speakers that have different accents. So those are the types of discussions that I try and bring into the classroom in, in Glasgow. I'm dealing with students that have very negative reactions to what they hear. A lot of students that get very anxious of speaking with, with local speakers. Um, Scotland is a little bit different because it's not just an accent that they're encountering. Um, in Scotland, we have um, what's called the Scots Linguistic Continuum, which is a continuum between Scottish Standard English, which is what I'm speaking now, and the Scots language itself. And often, um, very often, particularly in Glasgow, you hear speakers not just at either end of this continuum speaking in these two languages, they intermingle these two languages together. You know, so they use Scots words in Scottish Standard English. And if students have never heard or had any experience with Scots and its vocabulary, um, this can be really challenging. And that's not just for students, that's for anyone that is unfamiliar. Yeah. So it's an it's an extra challenge for students when they come here. And again, it's having those discussions that this is not bad English. Let me tell you what is going on. This is the linguistic environment you're in. Let's let's look at it in a little bit more detail so that you know what to expect. I imagine, depending where the student is from, um, they can understand that better because it probably happens there to a certain extent. I, I lived in Barcelona, in Catalonia for a while, and there it's very common to come across um, speakers who mix Catalan and, and Spanish, for example. Yeah. And then any of the English teachers who had lived there for a while ended up speaking either Spanglish to a certain extent, or Catalanglish, yeah. uh, which was a, was a thing. So I think that is definitely something I would imagine you could appeal to the students' own knowledge about their own background yeah. languages. My um, 
my colleague, my co-author, Robin Walker, has um, just exactly what you've just described, a, a lovely exercise in an article he wrote for Modern English Teacher, which I use myself. And it is basically a, a discussion lesson where you use students' own knowledge of their mother tongue, accents within their mother tongue, and that is the bridge to get them talking about English accents. Um, and he's, yeah, he's based in Spain, so he works with Spanish students as well. So it's allowing them to to kind of correlate how they associate with different accents in Spanish with accents in English. Um, but in the research that I did, it was, it was, like you said, it was very, very interesting the way the students talked about this. I had a student from Taiwan, and when we were doing an interview for uh, a study, you know, she said, well, you know, in Taiwan, we also have uh, an indigenous language. It's spoken by our grandparents, but we're not taught it, and it's looked down upon. So, so students often have, you know, a mirror image going on in their own culture, um, which allows them to relate. So being able to to use that to explore what's going on in English is really, really helpful. And I think it allows them to be more tolerant of the diversity of English because they see it happening mm. in their own language too. Yeah, and that's without even, uh, we haven't even talked about the role of things like slang, uh, mm -hmm. regional slang, uh, national slang, and then generational slang as well. You have different generations of um of people who might have their own kind of sub language, or I don't know how to describe it, but uh, yeah, idiolect, dialects, yeah, etc. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think you know the UK is, and I'm always kind of hesitant to use the word slang because I, I don't think mm -hmm. it often depicts what's really going on in the UK. Right. You know, you're from the northeast. Um, certainly the northeast and and Yorkshire and all of the north of England have this incredible history, linguistic history, which was influenced by Danes, the Danes who were there, that kind of, it's called the Scandinavian Belt, that area of north of England where the Danes settled and had an influence on the English spoken there. Um, so I'm always hesitant to use the word slang because it's it's not necessarily the case. It could be local um, vocabulary specific to that area and specific to that region's history. And I think it can be quite overwhelming for students, certainly if they're coming to the UK, because there is so yeah. much of that. It's not just informal or slang words that are used, but it's it's all of these local regional variations, which are very historic, which have lingered, um, but they they have to consider as well. But I think um, having having looked into this, you know, certainly for university students, which is the you know, the students I work with every day. Um, Despite saying all of this, they are still working more, uh, having more access to other international voices, not just local voices. Of course, of course. Um, because they're working with other international students and in universities, you know, universities are very diverse in terms of staffing. Um, so they're having a lot of access to other international Englishes where we do really see the need for discussions of local diversity is in the ESOL classroom. Students mm -hmm. that are here, they're they're, you know, planning to to stay, um, and probably will have some want or desire to integrate within their local community. These students really need the support with local varieties in particular, um, and I think it can be very empowering to give them that opportunity. Do you yourself work with these all students? I do. I've done a bit of voluntary work with uh, Glasgow ESOL Forum. Um, they've been very kind to me and let me come and do pronunciation classes with their learners. Um, so yes, no, it's it's great to have access to that because it is different. It, students' needs are different in the ESOL classroom to the EAP classroom. And it's wonderful for me to have the opportunity to look. I mean, I've taught in ESOL environments in the past. The last you know, 10, 12 years has been mainly EAP, so it's great to have the opportunity to look at both and know what the difference is in terms of their needs. And Gemma, in your bio that you sent me, you talked a little bit about, or you mentioned the Scottish Sound School. I'd love to hear a little bit more about that resource and what it is and how teachers can use it. Yeah. So since about 2018, I have run um, sessions and workshops 
for uh, teachers in Scotland about teaching pronunciation in a Scottish environment, because like me, most Scottish teachers have little to no training in pronunciation, never mind in their own pronunciation. So I, I see a lot of my experiences mirrored in local teachers. There's also many teachers in Scotland who are not Scottish, of course, they are international or they're from other parts of the UK. So because of that, they're also the lack of understanding of exactly how um, sounds might change in Scotland compared to other Englishes or other varieties. So I've been running training sessions uh, for the last few years on this. But um, the Scottish Sound School came about because I, uh, a piece of research that I did in, it was published in 2022 about the role of familiarity. Um, I really realised that so many resources and I just need to put them somewhere because I keep talking about them and people say, oh, is there a book about this? Is there a place I can go to learn more? And I would say, no, it doesn't exist. <laughs> um, so I, I just felt that I had to put my stuff somewhere about Scottish English and Scots. You know, what is happening in the language here? How can how can we learn more about it and how can we listen to it? And that's both teachers, but also for students. So I, it's it's still a small resource because I um I had to stop temporarily because I was writing a book with a with a colleague. So it's still a small resource at the moment, but um it's basically a website with blogs with links to a YouTube channel, and yeah, it's it's there to 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 provide familiarity to be a, a foundation for creating familiarity with Scottish speech, um, but also to explain what is going on in Scottish speech, so how it differs from other varieties. So that's the the, the reason behind it. And um, uh, I'm in the beginning of uh, creating a course to accompany it, and that's for, for English language teachers in Scotland. So lots of plans to come with that. But yeah, creating familiarity was the goal. Wonderful. I think this idea of having banks of examples of sounds of speech of people talking real people talking is so important isn't it and you know i see on the bad thing about social media you see all the bad stuff I see <laughs> so many teachers and a lot of volunteers who are on forums on social media saying where where can i get stuff where can i get resources help my students with local Scottish English. They live in Govan, in Glasgow. They aren't hearing RP voices. How can I support them? And, um, and, and that is what they, they need. They need this, this resource. And, and, I, and what's interesting to me is that a lot of teachers say, you know, these resources don't exist. But one of the most wonderful things that has come from social media is now there is so much available. I am recording stuff literally every single day. I'm sending yeah. emails to myself saying record this because on social media, I find Scottish voices everywhere of all different types, of all different backgrounds and all different parts of the country. Um, so I think social media has really changed that aspect for me. The voices are there if you are willing to go and find them. They exist. And once you, you, know, you adapt your algorithms, suddenly they are there being presented to you on a daily basis. So if you are looking for diverse voices to bring into your classroom, it's one of the great places to begin. Um, but there are other places as well you can go to find diverse voices. Um, a resource that I really love is um, Dynamic Dialects, which is a website um, run or created by uh, six universities here in Scotland. And they provide recordings of speakers from English is from all over the world. So that's a, a great place if you want to have a conversation and compare specifically different sounds. Um, other things like Hello, the website E L L L O org is a great range of very short videos from speakers from all over the world. Um, my English voice on YouTube. So there's, there's so much now that was not available when most of us started teaching. So I think really. If you are looking for, for different voices, now is a great time. We, we have so much more access now. Oh, yes. And e even just YouTube, the variety mm -hmm. of yeah. short 
clips of yeah. examples of real language is amazing, isn't it? And we can't forget Youglish as well. Youglish.com is just the most wonderful resource. Uh, it's a website. So if you want to show students how a word is pronounced, or if students want to check the pronunciation, they can go to youglish.com, write the word or the phrase into the into the search function or the search bar, and they'll be presented with speaker after speaker pronouncing this word. And they can choose the accent they want to listen to, or they can listen to multiple accents pronouncing it. Um, yeah, it's really wonderful, the, the new resources that are being developed to, to help with this. It feels like momentum is, is starting. Yeah. That's great. Um, what about the new developments in artificial intelligence and this mm. text to speech, speech to text, uh, which is seems to be improving in leaps and bounds? Is that something that has caught your attention? Is it of interest to you or not so much? It is. It is. And I'm certainly someone that uses um, certainly things like ChatGPT. I'm joint coordinator of ITFL pronunciation special interest group called PRONSIG. And in October, we are running our online conference on um, AI, artificial intelligence and pronunciation. So this is something we're talking about a lot. Um, like you're right that it's come on leaps and bounds. Certainly a few years ago, um, it was not being framed with many different voices. So a lot of people were struggling with voice recognition technology, it wasn't listening or understanding diverse accents, but also um, things like um, women's voices were not as clear to artificial intelligence um, because it was being trained on certain voices and not all voices. But that's definitely changing. I When I say it's definitely changing, I have witnessed, you know, conversations and, and piece of work and um, experts talking about new training for artificial intelligence. So there is more diversity being used to train AI now, but we're, as far as I'm aware, we're not yet at the point where it is perfect. It's not there that it recognises every single word. However, in saying that, there are some devices which can be great for teachers to use um, or encourage students to use for practice, um, especially if they're in a monolingual classroom. If you're in a monolingual classroom, you know, um, students will be familiar with one another's one another's voices. And so sometimes work on you know, pair work with pronunciation, you know, certain features might be missed because students understand each other because of that shared mother tongue background. So um, if you want to have students actually practicing with uh, other things that if you don't have access to other people from uh, different backgrounds to your students, then sometimes asking them to use uh, artificial intelligence can be an option as long as students are aware this is not perfect this may you know not work perfectly for you yet but sometimes it gives them an outlet where they can practice speaking and seeing if they can be understood so I think there's great potential there um, and certainly I think the the chat bots that are being created um, to allow students to have a, a conversation practice actually having a conversation with a chat bot which are being developed, I think they're very exciting uh, and will give another option for, for practice, for fluency building and, and conversation. So I think it's really exciting what is on the cards for the future, but we're, we're not there yet. Um, yeah, it's, it's going to be interesting to see over the next couple of years what's developed. Yes, it, it is an interesting time, definitely. Mm. And I, I know, for example, of someone who who has to drive uh, long journeys on their own and they've taken to using ChatGPT and the voice feature now that is in ChatGPT4 oh. to actually have conversations. Conversations, uh, nice. <laughs> yeah, so they, wow. you know, that whole thing about if you're on a long journey driving somewhere, you need someone to talk to to keep yourself awake. Um, well, the, this person now has uh, an artificial intelligent uh, oh. aid to, to help them stay awake fantastic yeah well that and then we're only at the beginning really yeah definitely um Gemma one one thing that I meant to ask you earlier uh, that I have seen happen um and I wondered about it was sometimes 
uh, students actually fall in love with accents and they mm. end up speaking in a particular accent. I in, in Barcelona, when I was um, teaching there, I had a, a, a colleague, I wasn't really a colleague, it's someone I knew, knew who worked in another, in another language institute in, in Barcelona, had a very strong Liverpool accent. And I was introduced to some of his students who had picked up his accent. They then wow. did so much with it that they end oh. up speaking in that way as well. This was quite some time ago. But mm -hmm. I wondered if you'd ever come across that, if that is something uh, unusual, et cetera. It's quite unusual. It's quite unusual. Um, I think with younger students, it can be quite, it's more likely, um, certainly, um, I do remember uh, when I was living in, in Italy in the beginning of my career, another job that I took, I was uh, like a classroom assistant and the, the teacher I was assisting was also a Scot. And um, and uh, they were, we were doing a storybook with students, things that go. And we got to the, the section of things that go on water, canoe. And all of the students said canoe with this perfect British <laughs> accent. <laughs> I think I think with with younger students, I think it's it's a little bit more common because they're still acquiring language. Yeah. Um, with adult students, it's less common. The students that I do see picking up Scottish accents, almost all are working in areas like catering, that kind of industry where they are surrounded by you know, local people and they're communicating with local people all the time. Um, they're the people I really notice coming uh, with Scottish accents. Um, and interestingly, a, a student, one student I had that had a, a very Scottish accent, um, she was uh, a, she was completely blind. She was visually impaired. Um, so she'd learned English, you know, in a kind of auditory way. And um, she picked up this perfect Scottish, you know, completely Scottish accent in her in her studies. So I think it's unusual, but it's certainly possible for, for students to pick these things up. Yes. Uh that's interesting you were saying you know when students work with in a particular industry etc so i think mm. it it's it's always a good thing to bond with the people that you work with uh if you do things like speak similar way you end up when you do work with people and we see we see that as english teachers but yeah, also yeah. in any profession etc um people pick up the kind of jargon yeah. of the profession or they end up picking up the same words or learning mm -hmm. words from each other and adopting them etc there's a lot yeah, of that yeah. goes on and that's probably to kind of identify yourself with a, a group of people isn't it yes exactly it's group identification it comes back to that whole kind of tribal aspect of pronunciation um you know where we're so sensitive to accent um we can we can identify uh, a foreign accent in seconds you know we, we are so sensitive to it um we can even identify a foreign accent in english that is being played backwards we are so so sensitive to it and it is it's this kind of you know ancient aspect that was for protection you know someone that was not from the tribe they sounded different we need to be on alert so it's this kind of really really old um, aspect of kind of tribal uh, culture that was just, re just retained um, that allows us to identify an insider or an outsider who's part of the tribe, who's part of the club. And yeah, if you're if you're integrating into a, a group or a community, one of the ways you show that is by accommodating your voice to show that you know you sig to signify that you belong to that group too. So yeah, and it's something that that we all do, and certainly that's. My mum always moans at me and says, you know, well, when I've lived abroad, how my voice changes because I can't stop it. I can't stop how, you know, wanting to kind of be more like the people that I'm working alongside and spending my time with. It just happens. Not everyone does this. Um, mm. it's in, not, it, it, some people do keep their accent and have a very, you know, strong accent and, and don't, are not affected by this. They retain it. And like you said, it's, it's, it's a show of, that group identity and and wanting to retain your uh, group identity rather than merge into another one. So it's it's really fascinating. Yes, it's it's always it's something 
as as someone who's pretty much lived half their life uh, in Spanish speaking countries, uh, in Spain, in Uruguay, in Mexico now, um, it's something I've always wondered about because accent, for example, does seem to be part of a strong part of someone's identity. And whenever I speak Spanish, I I feel uncomfortable adopting a local accent, for example. It feels like I'm being false. Um, so I've never been able to fully embrace uh, the speaking of Spanish, for example, with a local accent. I can do it if I try, but it always feels like I shouldn't be doing it. Almost like I'm taking the mickey out of the people that yeah. I'm, I'm talking to, etc. But then there are other people, my wife, for example, whenever she speaks a foreign language, uh, she's Spanish, Um she ends up whoever she's speaking to imitating them also mm -hmm. or, yeah. almost even locally if she's talking to she's from galicia in the northwest of spain mm. if she's speaking to someone from the south of spain by the end of the conversation she's speaking like them and it's no, like it's them, fascinating yeah. it is, and that's, it's, that's it's something that actors yeah. have to do as well yeah actively yeah but yeah, so much of this is subconscious that as we mm. as we communicate with people, we mirror them. If we have a positive relationship, if we're having a you know a, a productive conversation, so yeah, it's a, it's a subconscious kind of uh, act that happens to many of us without us noticing. Yeah, I'm guessing it's something related to kind of mirroring the speaker mm -hmm. to a to a sort of extreme uh, yeah. with uh, the person sort of almost imitating do you know if there are any studies about that as in it providing a positive experience to the listener or a negative experience to the listener when it happens or does it depend or i'm not familiar with any of that with regards to the listener's feelings about it um i'm not sure from that perspective um but certainly accommodating our voice and our body language to to others that's certainly been studied that's something which is is kind of well documented how, how speakers change to to kind of reflect the, the person that they're conversing with but yeah I'm not sure from the listener's perspective and Gemma I'd like to talk a little bit about your um involvement in teacher associations uh, yeah. which you mentioned earlier your work with the IATEFL, which for those listeners who are unfamiliar with it, is the International Association of Teachers of English as a Foreign Language. <laughs> um, and they have special interest groups, and one of them is pronunciation, the PRONSIG. Um, could you talk a little bit about how you got involved with the teacher association, with the PRONSIG, what kind of benefits you feel belonging to a SIG? has given you and uh, for, you know, I I have my own feelings about this because I used to be part of the learning technology SIG of IATEFL. <laughs> I was coordinator and oh. I'm always trying to encourage people to get involved in teacher associations. Yeah. So I'd love to hear your take on it. Sure. So I joined IATEFL when I was in 2015 and when you join IATEFL you get to choose a SIG that you want to join as part of your membership and at that time I was starting to become more and more uh, interested in pronunciation so PromSIG was just a, a kind of immediate choice for me was was no uh, no option for anything else and um with I just immediately felt that this was my <laughs> this was my tribe we talked about tribe already but um mm -hmm. I felt that this was the people that got me they they had the same issues they found solutions these were talking about the things that I were interested in immediately you know I was reading the the, the journals and attending the events and I, I immediately at home and I was learning and then a year later um, I was actually going through my my spam email for some reason, trying to find something, and I saw that there'd been a, a call for committee members for Fonsig, and the deadline was that day. So I was like, oh, quickly put something together because you know I had really positive you know initial year with the organisation, um, and that's how I became a committee member. That was 2016, 
And then, um, so obviously when you're part of the committee or you're part of um, organising events and, and um, different aspects of the group and, and how you're reaching out to members. And shortly after, the editor of the journal at the time uh, requested some help. And so I started helping her. And then that led to me getting the position of editor of our biannual journal, Speak Out. And I was an editor for about seven years. Recently just hung up my pen, given it to two wonderful new incoming editors. Um, now I'm I'm joint coordinator. I became joint coordinator in 2020 alongside my colleague Kevin Scott. But um I think teacher associations are so so important and so useful for teachers because they provide the resources that we that most of us don't get and certainly for pronunciation most of us do not get training in pronunciation and so teachers association specializing in pronunciation fills that gap that we all have in our training and in our knowledge um and since 2020 you know we've been a lot more obviously we've been online a lot more so we now run um, hybrid events for our PCE once a year, the ISF annual conference. So people can attend online or in person. And we have our online conference every October, as well as lots of different things like webinars, book clubs, meet the expert events, workshops. So we're basically just trying to reach all of those teachers that, like us, have a bit of fear or anxiety or lack knowledge in pronunciation, and they need that support, they need advice, they need resources, we're trying to fill that gap. Um, I know how powerful it has been for me. If I had not been part of Ronsig, um, the opportunities that I've had would not have had. So it's it's been real, really significant how much I have gained from being a part of the organisation and the committee, friends that I've made, the networks I've made, but also the confidence that I I gained you know it was just exactly what I was looking for and we've actually just completed a study um, which will be published I think next year about the role of, a, of, of teachers associations but particularly in pronunciation and what we found is that when we were asking you know we asking members about their experience they had similar uh, things to report you know how it had impacted their confidence um, their repertoire for teaching pronunciation, um, but also access to experts and knowledge. So it can be really, really a life changing thing and career changing thing to be part of a teacher's organisation. And for anyone who isn't part of one, I would absolutely recommend it. What is your local teacher's organisation? Um, there are different ones all over the world. Uh, it can be such uh, an important support. And if there isn't one, maybe start one. Uh, because there will be people <laughs> like you out there who is looking for more and um it can be yeah it can be such a beneficial thing yes i think um i think i know that a lot of teacher associations are struggling um with with finding members these days yeah. because the one of the big draws to to being part of a teacher association, of course, or the events, be they face to face or online. And I think definitely since the pandemic, there have been a rise of sort of free online events that uh, for teachers. And I know a lot of teachers think, well, why I don't need to be part of a teacher association. But I think um, for me, there's so much more than just attending events you get out of yeah. being with other teachers. Oh, yeah. um, you know, either, you know, local teacher associations, you suddenly find the ability to kind of talk to teachers who are teaching all sorts of different things. And it's all of the informal networking, et cetera, I think that yeah. you get the benefit from, which you don't get on, from online events. Definitely. Yeah, it's, um, there are rewards there. If you, mm. if you are motivated, you can engage with the organisation beyond the the freebies there are rewards there and not just in terms of the knowledge that you gain but the opportunities that come your way um so i would certainly say that by becoming a member and having access and having like you see this this opportunity to meet and network and speak to other people opportunities come from that 
So um, yeah, for, for those people that are looking for something more, um, joining up, it, it can have, yeah, it can be transformative. Yes, definitely. Um, so Gemma, what does the future hold for you? I'm kind of moving towards the end of our conversation. We have uh, mm. time running out. Um, I'd love to hear a lot about what your future plans are, what kind of things you see um, you doing in the future, or even the future of pronunciation teaching. Um, where is that heading? For me, um, certainly I'm, I'm doing a lot more teacher training these days. Um, I'm, I'm working with different organizations to support teachers like us who, who lack this kind of uh, initial training with pronunciation. So I'm doing a lot more of that. Um, I'm working with uh, a, a US-based company now called Color, well, they're called English Language Training Solutions, but they have a wonderful product called Color Vowel um, and they have a Color Vowel chart which is a, a wonderful uh, tool for teaching English pronunciation, which I absolutely love using. And it's a great way to teach and to talk about different accents as well. So um, certainly teaching pronunciation to teachers, teacher training, working with uh, color vowel is, is, is happening more for me and I hope to do more of it in the future. But I also would really like to do a lot more um, locally uh, as well. So a lot more research into supporting local students particularly in the ESOL community, how we can do that to, to help them become accustomed to, to local speech as well. So there's a few more research papers to come, I feel. Great. And what about the future of pronunciation teaching? Do you think, is it easy to predict what, what kind of changes are going to happen? Or is that something out of, out of reach or out of not it's, possible? It's difficult, it's difficult to predict. Um, what we can certainly say is that pronunciation is over the last kind of hundred years, it's been a bit of a roller coaster. Um, you know, it's its importance has gained attention and then waned um, from the 1970s, 80s, when the communicative method started to become well known and popular and integrated. People initially said, well, we don't need to teach pronunciation because students will just absorb pronunciation through communicative tasks. But we know that's not the case. We know that students need explicit pronunciation instruction. So what I feel is that this is starting to become more well known. Uh, people are starting to realise that pronunciation is important. Um, certainly, we're going through a wonderful period at the moment where there's a lot more pronunciation text being published both for teachers, for researchers, and for, for, you know, certainly for resources for the classroom. It's a real kind of golden age for publications and pronunciation at the moment. So I think people are starting to realize how fundamental pronunciation is. And I, I hope that that will continue to grow. Um, but I think it will also really come down to um, course books. Um, and I hate to say that because obviously we know course books are not the be all and end all of teaching, but they're still a very, very commonly used resource in classrooms around the world. And I think when they include more pronunciation, and in particular, in particular when they include more international accents and voices of English, I think that is when people will, will really wake up to how pivotal these things are for our learners. Um, and that will, will start to really increase the change. I feel that change is coming. I, I feel, you know, things have changed. Certainly, I've observed in the last 20 years. And I, I feel that positive change is happening. Um, the, the book that I wrote with Robin Walker, Teaching English Pronunciation for a Global World, that was released this year. And, and I think certainly what Robin has said to me, having pub he's published in this area before, is that it feels like the time is right now. People are responding very positively to this. Um, whereas in the past, it, it was a bit more subdued. So I think things are changing for the better. And I hope that it continues to change. Fantastic. Gemma, I've really enjoyed talking to you and hearing uh, all about pronunciation today. Um, thank you so much for sharing your uh, knowledge and time with us. Uh, I'm sure uh, the listeners will all appreciate what you've had to say. Thank you so much for inviting me. Imagine having your own instructional coach available 24-7. Now 
you can with the teaching how to's platform this highly personalized social platform empowers busy teachers to learn and apply evidence-based teaching techniques either independently working collaboratively with their peers or with our new ai assistant the platform features over 160 visual guides to teaching techniques designed to help you quickly and easily implement high-impact practices that boost student engagement and improve learning outcomes. Join over 200 institutions worldwide that are elevating their teaching practices with the How To app. No gurus, just practical support anytime you need it. Interested in finding out more? Visit teachinghowtos.com and register for our next webinar. Empowering education with Easy For You, where innovation meets accessibility. Our subscription-based offering not only equips schools with cutting-edge devices, but revolutionizes the learning experience by eliminating financial barriers, streamlining support, and embracing technology, we're not just providing tools. We're shaping a future where every student can thrive, unburdened by limitations. Easy for you, transforming education, one device at a time. Find out more at www.easyforyou. Dot school. This show is brought to you in partnership with John Cat Educational, publishers of professional development books and resources that support great teaching and learning in schools around the world. Don't miss out. Level up your professional development today and visit johncatbookshop.com to explore the full range of titles. Use the code JCTTR2425 for 20% off your order. Happy reading. Hi, teachers. We're Apps for Good, and we give schools like yours free introductory computing courses. Our courses are for everyone, including those who aren't computing teachers, and they're fully equipped with resources mapped to the UK computing curriculum. Independent learning is central to our courses. Your students will develop essential and digital skills by working in teams to create prototype apps for good. We'll even connect you with industry volunteers to give real-world feedback. Let's empower every young person you teach to shape their future with technology. Speak to us at www.appsforgood.org. So that brings us to the end of today's Twilight Show. Many thanks to today's special guest, Gemma Archer and to Chris Fry and all of the others who joined us live during the show. Thank you, too, of course, to everyone listening back to the recording. And so that's it from me. There are Teachers Talk radio shows all week on all manner of interesting topics, so please listen in live or to the recordings. And I hope you will join me again next week at the same time. Bye for now. You've been listening to Teachers Talk Radio. Tune in live and listen back at ttradio.org. We look forward to hearing from you next time on Teachers Talk Radio.